Hello, and I'm here with Nadia Lee Smith of Superstructure. I almost called you Nadia because that's what I know you on the internet as. Um, and um, we're going to talk about why you got into MMT Humanities and how um, that's changed. Um, how has affected your political trajectory? Oh gosh! So we, we're going to start with like some small questions. <laughs> uh, MMT Humanities. It's funny. Like I initially met these guys through like the first Money on the Left episode I ever heard was uh, when Neoclassical Marxism. Do you know? Do you know this Twitter account, Neoclassical Marxism? Uh, uh, no. Anyway, it's like kind of a parody account that Will does and uh, Will Beeman, and he did an interview with money on the left uh, with Max. And I was like, oh, this is interesting. And I followed all of them. And then um, as like the Bernie election was going on, it's like people I met on Twitter and I think they started Superstructure Podcast. And I don't know, I just got talking to them and it sort of helped me get out of certain traps, like things in my thinking that I was kind of stuck on and like helped me get new insight into like the political economy of um, sort of institutions and things in a, and sort of this post Bernie malaise and ways that I felt like were responding to things in the discourse that I don't know, it helped me see things and frame things in a new way where I, I, had more insight in different ways. I don't know. That's a very vague answer, but it's a big question. Okay. Um, so what 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 do you think the the primary key insight was that got you going on this uh, trajectory? That's a good question. Well, I remember like when do you remember when Doug Henwood had that like Jacobin piece that came out that was like MMT is not helping. And I remember on Twitter, I like read all the responses, like, you know, like Randall Ray and all these people like had different uh, response pieces. And it was, that was like my introduction to like, okay, what are the stakes of this argument? And then with like the neoclassical Marxism, I kind of like had insight into, you know, you're kind of in this moment where there's this reformist program, right? Where you have this Bernie moment that's very focused on taxes and, you know, there's this sort of, I don't know, Matt Brunig line, like we're gonna count things a lot and have UBI and like tax people a lot, right? And then kind of this parody of the way that was imagining work and UBI and um, the way it doesn't understand spending, like this sense that like spending is mere keystrokes and that like is disconnected from class, which is this other thing that exists over here. And that, I don't know, it just, it seemed to me like it was pointing out a lot of things that were incoherent that I hadn't realized why I had, like, you know, I'd read from a lot of these different traditions and things where I felt like, okay, Marxism has some good things about trying to interrogate like where injustice and power dynamics and how that's all working. But I think kind of in the, I don't want to say the brass tacks, but like in the shape of the brass tacks sometimes would like leave me uninterested in a way like where I didn't feel like it was getting into all the details of how things were really working. And I think, you know, I think a lot of um, the economic critique of like uh, money on the left and neoclassical Marxism, you know, you have this Nathan Tankis critique, which is like really crucial, of like understanding the way that Marxism sometimes has this problem of uh, using price theory or using ideas about money that are compatible with like neoclassical economics and aren't understanding kind of the way that is like understands that you need spending or whatever, but also like against its better instincts is repressing some of these things, like the sort of interior conflict that's constantly going on where people are like, Oh, the media has fallen, but also we need it, but I don't know. And then you just get in this like circular, I just feel like sometimes the left gets in these circular self-obsessive arguments where it's like people get not thinking about the actual shape of things and the shape of the way things could be. They get in sort of these obsessive traps. And I think this uh, sort of institutional realism mixed with this sort of like theoretical intervention into you know, kind of listening to superstructure in the beginning, I was like, oh, this is interesting. Things I haven't heard before, right? Like, 
uh, critiquing a gambin about like, I'm, that was horribly pronounced, about capital or whatever and thinking about uh, eco-fascism and I don't know, just but combining that with like a critique of Amber Frost and this sort of effective violence within certain milieus of like left discourse. I don't know, it's just, it, it's sort of like, we're sort of in this different moment now, right? Where you have like Biden and you have the Democrats and they're, I don't know, and Bernie failed twice and this like reverberates in different ways in different places. But I think there's a way in which thinking the theory, thinking the political economy is like, opens up other avenues as opposed to like the same repeating question about like what has failed. I don't know if that makes sense, but you're a good. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, let's, let's, let's do that <laughs> a little bit. So, um, why do you think that, uh, MMT, like MMT initially did not meet a whole lot of hostility from, from Marxists. Like when, when we were, um, in fact, actually I was probably one of the most hostile people to it, uh, <laughs> 10 years ago. Um, um, how dare you, <laughs> but, um, it, the hostility has seemingly increased from people who have frankly politics and aren't that far from it. Um, yeah, totally. Yeah. So why do you think that is? Like, wh what do you think well, that's, that's kind of what's interesting? Mm -hmm. Because I think, I think there is, I think that's why I do believe that kind of the theory read is important because I do think that there's some amount of uh, sell. I don't know. It's really hard to explain. I don't, I don't want to like psychoanalyze people, right? But there is like a certain amount of, you're so of this thing that you hate it. And so I don't, it's, it's very strange to be honest. It's like not like if you're on a reformist platform, right. And like the main, really like the main plank of a reformist platform, like somewhere like the U S and really anywhere is going to be like, if you don't have something already like that, a type of medical Medicare for all thing and like a green new deal type of program, right? Like that's kind of, internationally, some type of like state, private, like, you know, move to sustainable, you know, thing. But if you are just sort of reifying the sense of the market is like outside of us and is just doing what it does and that, you know, prices are in this chaotic, uh, like encounter place. I don't know. It's just the sense of like lack of control in Marxian economics, which I think is very sympathetic because we are like mostly deprived of control, but that it's important in order to contend with control to understand what the way things are actually working and like what it is you're trying to change and like what are possible like shapes forward. And if you don't understand spending, you're going to constantly contradict yourself because you're going to be like, you know, like, I don't know, it's like watching the Chilean debates for president, you know, it's, it's like this never ending on the left and the right. It's like, everything is like small business PMA. Like, do we give them money? Do we not give them money? Do we, you know, is small business good or bad? And, or like splitting hairs about crime police and like taxes. Right. And on the left, like, can we get 5%? Can we get 8%? Like, can we do that in one year? Can we do that in four years? And it's the sense of like that epistemology is not the whole thing, like this false epistemology of spending. But on the other hand, there is this sense of like a limited horizon of like wanting good things. But if we can't understand kind of this institutional quote unquote realism of like how theoretically green jobs or like reigning in like outsized neoliberal privatized international like right import export like these markets that are like where the economy ends up getting centered and that's where marxian insight is valid right in the way that these like power imbalances within the economy get away from themselves but if we attribute all of that to to money or to spending or to that you just you lose somewhere in there you lose the understanding of like the vision of like what is a possible horizon to an extent. I don't know if that. Yeah. Makes sense um, to 
So you mentioned very, epistemo- I'm very abstract. Right. So you mentioned <laughs> epistemology <laughs> in, involved in this. Can you tease out the epistemological differences that you think are going on? That what's the difference in knowledge, and and why do you think mm-hmm. that matters so much? Like because it does seem to be crucial to the project of MMT humanities. It does. Yeah. Well, I think I think because if you are not engaging with understanding, like the possibility of spending as if if the history of like oppression and violence with spending is always only domination and control. Like it's impossible to actually understand the way it works. And that I don't think it's just like, oh, well now with this new understanding, we can uh, better convince our voters and activate more people. Like I understand where there's an epistemological like gap there, right? That like saying, oh, well now we're telling you that we're in a post scarcity model where uh, actually, you spend before taxing, uh, like, well, trans- I don't think it's just like there's going to be a Gnostic revelation of the possibility of spending. And I do think it's possible that, like, within these, like, reformist left projects that believe they're basing their Green New Deal or whatever, like, project on taxation can have the same type of vision. But I do think that, like, if you notice both sides on this, like, taxpayer money uh the economy is what it is like it's just gonna do its thing and like there's gonna be i mean i know people in you know like in these sort of reformist communist you know this like gramsci and you're communist thing who are like big believe they're like no like international free trade is great and like you gotta like re- like they really believe that like you gotta grow the economy in a neoliberal way so that you can tax it more and that that's what economics from the left is. And that that's, I think you always have to contend with like, what's the dialogue with um, social change as far as like, where do protests and riots like interact right with them, like a cycle of left voting and like apathy. And so that's like one part of that. And that connects to epistemology as far as, okay, what makes people engaged or not engaged? But I think regardless of all these questions of like sort of efficacy and what happens, I I think it's malpractice to be trying to understand suffering and poverty in a way where you want better things for people. If your engagement with left political economy like isn't recognizing the reality of the way projects are created or not created, because then you cannot it's not because that epistemology is absolute, but you can't ever really engage. All right. Um, so one thing is going to come the up. ADHD. Uh, yeah, I understand. <laughs> one thing that's going to come up from this is uh, I think that MMT has a variety of policies that might emerge given its acceptance. And some people might say, well, just I, I, in fact, I'm going to take something from the comment section right now. It just, just sounds like Blairism stimulate the economy, and then you can recoup it later. Um, I do think there is, I do think to, to back that back a little bit, people need to look at the fact that MMTers actually sometimes advocate wildly different things that should be done with the, uh, the, the it, injection of liquidity into the market to use technical terms. But like, um, by increasing the money supply through, you know, and through either not yeah. taxing or printing money, right? Um, no, I, every MMT who's ever existed is my best friend. <laughs> yeah, yeah uh, Warren Mosler and Bill Mitchell are totally okay with you, correct? Um, I, I'm, I, not sh- I, I'm not sure if they're like, yeah, I don't, I'm not sh- yeah, I yeah, I, I won't make not, you. I won't I'm make not, I'm not too stance. concerned. No, I'm not too concerned about their opinion. Like to me, it's like it's funny if they know I exist because I know it's like, um, I have the power. <laughs> <laughs> so, your podcast. Uh, um, well, I should say your podcast is a podcast of, of, a, of a collective of people. What three or four now? Um, yeah, well, like the original two were Max and that's why I mentioned neoclassical Marxism because it is funny that because because money on the left is like a Scott Scott Ferguson, Max Seho, Billy Sash show, right? And they do like deep dives with economists, lawyers, different policy people, um, and then neoclassical Marxism. I listened to that episode that had like this 
a parody account that Will and now Scott and sometimes me and Max were more lazy uh, are in on, but that uh, that was kind of the pilot for Max and Will doing their superstructure show, which they started like right after uh, Bernie lost. And you know, the, it's not the first, as you we were just talking on Twitter, it's not the first left malaise. <laughs> um, you were saying how you think like the left has kind of been in the US since the 1920s recovering from a series of shocks. I have no idea, if, but um, I think that there's sort of this sense that there was, there was an early, like during Trump, there was an early kind of explosion of like the social democratic left energy, right? Like, okay, well, Bernie's just lost, but like maybe 2020, we got it right. And then, so you have all those four years and then that's going on with Corbyn. And there's this sort of this like left uh, reformist strong um, moment. And then I think, you know, Biden wins and then and then Biden also wins against Trump. So you don't have like this shock of Trump anymore. And I think there's a bit of like a, an impasse in terms of people knowing sort of where they fit into this uh, indefinite next period, right? Because, no, you know, Biden, who knows if that will be four years or eight years. And then, but then there's also this question of what does contestation look like with the Democrats, right? In terms of this like theoretical, lost um, progressive agenda, which I think there were limits in the way, even though like, you know, Bernie had Stephanie Kellen sometimes like advising, he was still like working with this like sort of fair share universalism that wasn't always speaking uh, with this taxation model that wasn't always speaking to like, I mean, there were things, there were a lot of things that were speaking to a possible democratic like left progressive agenda, right? And so this question of, well, what is, contesting that look like with a neoliberal Democrat uh, in power as opposed to this sort of like proto post fascist comic, right? Like, and so this sort of transition moment, and then um, I forget what your original question was, but I think, <laughs> I think Max and right, Matt superstructure that Max and Will came in and we were talking and then I got talking to them, we were in the comments and, and yeah, and then you kind of dig deeper and you know, Scott, Scott Ferguson has like, you know, this sort of like deep read that I think, you know, as someone who's spent time sort of in being a nerd, I don't know, like in Marxist theory and reading things, uh, he's fucking read everything. And I think there's sort of this like liminal understanding of, okay, I see like this sense of what you're reading of like where this is not really reading how economics works quite correctly, where this is kind of repressing performance and mediation out of this sense of failure. I don't know, like this sort of impasse, which is like a big part of the history of the left, right? And the history of left theory, right? Like everybody knows the, the Frankfurt School is kind of coming out. That's what everybody reads, right? And that's coming out of this moment of kind of like left failure. And so it, just these questions of like, where can we intervene with our watching and speaking, right? And does it matter if we understand what is and isn't happening? And I just think there's sort of a scramble right now because there was this sort of wave of, you know, post-Trump, a lot of people getting into politics and then this anti-lib movement, right? And this sort of effective register of Chapo and the dirtbag left of like, let's not be cynical libs who are like just using these like things that are real oppressions and like doing it in a bullshit but but then that like watching the way that that kind of like deteriorated right and then that the way I don't know and I think it's been interesting to watch the ways that's deteriorated in terms of like hopelessness or like I don't know pseudo history that isn't contending with the ways in which um there's always these, I don't know. So to there's a lot of threads in there. Um, so I'll pick up on a couple. What one one to two? <laughs> um, so one thing I will say about the the specific branch of MMT that you are affiliated with, which is the broader MMT Humanities Left MMT Project, is that it does actually take seriously 
some of the critiques of MMT's methodological nationalism from its chartalist and neo-chartalist heritage. Um, can you speak to that a little bit? How has MMT Humanities tried to answer that problem that is often just kind of waved off by a lot of other MMTers? Yeah, I mean, I think it's interesting that a lot of the sort of tax and spend uh, left Marxist critique will say like their first one of their first critiques of MMT will be well like internationally this is not going to work in the same way because there's this different set of uh, currency limitations or import export things right and so I think that some MMTers it's just strange to me that I think this critique is capacitated to an extent by people being like, yeah, like, well, if you're a monetary sovereign, like you can totally spend like, <laughs> and it's like, I can understand why that engenders mistrust, right? The sense of like, oh, like, just like, if you have the state that's the most powerful, you're the only one who can spend. But, but I think you got to like, turn it inside out, right? Whereas actually, it's like this sort of uh, understanding of the way colonialism and banks and monetary history works is that, yeah, of course, precisely the way that colonialism and neoliberalism works is to like deprive this sense of monetary agency, right? And I think one of the money on the left interventions has been to like contend this uh, vocabulary of sovereignty and like to call it agency because I think the contention is that, yes, sovereignty has this set of like potentials for minoritarian uh, nationalisms in different ways that you could claim as like for a justice against an empire, but that there are potential like impulses towards a sort of over reification of like this location of nationalism. And that it's like trying to challenge that this sort of agency is prior. And so even if you are in sort of this reformist revolutionist project, like dialoguing with some like state power that like, you don't want to like, create this legal sovereignty category as a accidental and be like, absolute, I don't know, like that, we're aware of these power structures, but that just kind of being like, this is the way things work. And this is what you can do. Like, that doesn't make sense. Like, that's actually like, very against a read of like what a deep MMT reading I think would be like in this sort, you know, you have like um, Fidel Kaboob or um, Silva in Africa writing about like he wrote, Silva wrote in Dongo for um, Money on the Left about how like this French colonialism in, there was this extractive impulse, but also not allowing there to be funding in the African colonies, right? and. I think to me, it's like to say that this critique that people will have of MT is like precisely the point. Okay. Um, I don't know if that makes sense. Kind of. Uh, so the, the critique that people <laughs> have of MT is precisely the point about monetary within sovereignty. Some sectors, within some sectors, like as far as mm -hmm. some people not, not attending to that history. Right. So I mean, that, does mm -hmm. that make sense? Yeah, I remember when I listened to Warren Mosler and his description um, of of MMT's uh, uh, initial ordination, particularly because it focused on debt, sounded verbatim uh, like what Cecil Rhodes did to to South Africa and Rhodesia. Um, Same word. And, I mean, well, it was it was using a current using a currency compelling taxes and debts that were non-existent to be paid in that currency to force people into the labor market off of off of hunter gatherer lands and then to compel them to divide up tribal lands and individual properties and in which they would have to sell to the British to get more of the currency that they would then use to pay off the debts. And that was Warren Mosler's <laughs> picture of the origins of money. Um, and and when I, I, I don't, I don't this, know, I don't know what you're referring to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, and when I when I uh, when I I was arguing with one of his uh, fans, who I actually quite like, um, uh, Sam Kangaroo. Well, he's Luke. explaining the way the way things work. It's just that, yeah, right. And I mean, but, not, I, but I was just like, bro, yeah, it's more. I mean. It's hard to when people know that, and you're like, "Well, how can we use this for a left wing agenda again?" Right? And what? Well, well, and that's where I think the money on the left perspective is. That's I, I think that's where we're like part of trying to complicate sovereignty is in like 
that this is like originary, right? That like, there, I mean, there are debates about this, right? Like in David Graeber's, like is money, is counting an inherent sort of debt uh, domination relation? And I think our contention is that like, uh, it depends. And, but that still this uh, sense of counting, the sense of um, credit is always at issue. And so like, right, exactly the point of colonialism is that it like, artificially built credit scarcity in a way where the only kind of credit possible could be this like neoliberal privatized credit. But then Marxism reads that as like eternal. I don't know. And so I think we contend that like the point of abolitionist MMT is precisely to read against those readings of sovereignty that are uh, reifying, I, I use that word too much, but like that are seeing the nationals, like just something you arrived at. Right. And we, we happen to be able to spend and we have like super really real resources. Um, as opposed to like, this is always at issue in terms of like, you know, a going concern and production maintenance is, and that, whenever monetary counting scarcity is there, that's like built into the whole system and understanding the way the system works is to understand the way in which like we design this. And the question is like contesting design. Okay. But to so, contest design, you have to like know how things are designed so, to some extent. So, so the, one of the things that I have been interested in is uh, both not just the I mean, the, the conceptual moving away from talking about sovereignty is it is interesting in and of itself, but that's not as interesting of a question in some ways as in what does that conceptual change actually mean for policy? Um, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, for example, um, and again, to bring up some controversies with MMT itself, Bill Mitchell's embrace of like Legxit or, or left Brexit. Um, right as an answer is structurally similar to what some proto MMT or some fans of Minsky, um, like Steve King were advocating for Greece in, in the early parts of, uh, the, the, the aught teens. Um, sure. and I think what I saw interestingly is that the first people who critique that were like, you know, Dr. Non Marxist like myself, but the next people who critique it, <laughs> Um, the next people who critique it, I was on the beat. <laughs> um, the next people who critique, critiqued it, though, were actually other MMTers who pointed out the kinds of binds that this would get Greece in, and then they uh, pointed out similarly uh, to Great Britain. Now, the question becomes, though, if you're breaking down sovereignty like that, you talk about stuff like, uh, uh, um, I think a lot of it's being floated, for example, in, th in uh, like developing world MMT theory is like um, uh, governmental coalitions, but but without getting stuck into the sovereignty crisis as you get it stuck with in the EU. Um, what I find interesting about that is that conversely on the left, when people critique you guys about uh, being crypto imperialist. <laughs> um, How dare they? Um, <laughs> one of the things, yeah. One of the things that they'll do is that all you have to point out that their, their tax policy is also effectively functionally nationalist and would also require high GDPs to be able to pull off, which would make oh, yeah. them, frankly, even more dependent on imperialism. Um and right. so, yeah. and there's no discussion there. There is not a real viable, like social democratic tax and spend foreign policy counter to this MMT problem. Whereas at least right now, in one, one, one sector of MMT, someone is trying to think about this, right? Like, so right. one of the reasons why I'm interested in what, what the MNT humanities is doing is that Marxists really would have to start answering like, how would these international orders uh, actually work? Particularly if you have a reformist mindset, um, what would it actually look like? And I don't think you get that because a lot of the argument is basically tribal, frankly. I mean, 
Um, I love tribes. <laughs> Sorry, I can't, uh, I can't, I can't not do my touch. <laughs> I know you gotta, you gotta do the commentary. Yeah. Um, I know. What are you gonna um, do? <laughs> but um, it's it's an interesting predicament because there is a sense of which you know I'm. Uh, the left exiters could point out legitimate things with the EU that's a problem. For example, the way that its trade regime kind of yeah. puts a, a break on a lot of labor stuff. But yeah. we also can completely see that undoing um, uh, the the Britain's relationship to the EU has actually made all that probably worse, not better. I mean, um, yeah. so having a group of people actually thinking about these problems is important even for Marxists who don't entirely agree with you because <sighs> you're actually thinking about <laughs> problems that are being avoided. Um, yeah. One of the other things I think is interesting is a lot of the, I mean, and this is implied in what I just said, but maybe you can talk about it a little bit and then we'll pivot to Chile. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of the people critiquing MMT on this imperialist logic um, mm -hmm. uh you guys have pointed out have functionally nationalist rhetoric and in fact have even used the, the need to build labor coalitions or, you know, what or whatever to move culturally and even sometimes fiscally, frankly, to mm -hmm. the right in their rhetoric. Yeah, definitely. Um, why do you think that is? I mean, I think it's when you have uh, this, sense of the orthodox vision sort of being unconsciously implicit in some amounts of Marxism. Like we've talked about this with Jesus Resendiz in Mexico, that there can be an extent to which I think out of good faith, you feel like, okay, well, this is the money that exists and we need to tax that. And there's not that much of that money that we have from the economy. And I think that there's a sense of like, not, um, I forget, sorry, what was the original question? <laughs> I had a good answer oh, in my mind. <laughs> um, so uh, I was, I asked you, um, why do you think so many of the, uh, of the people who critique MMT for being imperialist have such effective nationalist policies and have even moved a lot of their rhetoric right-ish, both culturally and sometimes like you were saying, I think you're applying in Mexico, it, the, the case would definitely be in the case of AMLO, even yeah. fiscally, to the right to build their mm -hmm. programs up. And this, uh, historically speaking, this isn't even new. Like uh, we saw this with the SPD in Germany in the 1920s. Like they actually implemented austerity, which was part right. of why the fascists were able to use um, certain kinds of rhetoric see, so effectively. See Scott, Scott Ferguson and Max Sejo's recent article in um, <laughs> Money oh. on the Left. Well, they were talking about that. They were talking about how there's this sort of, I think it's like a 70s historian. Robert Gates talks about this sort of debate within the Social Democrats where you have Hilferdine, who's kind of representing this Social Democrat view of like, capitalism is what capitalism is, right? And then we take our cut, whereas opposed to like the sense of fiscal um deconcentrated federalism where like there is an ability to create different programs or job programs was repressed and i think they argue that's like part of the sense of like reifying the absolute liberal economy but just reading it like from the inside out in this marxist lens where we're going to tax this like sad uh neoliberal economy is this um repression of the way in which it's anything like private growth is like originarily a public claim, mm -hmm. right? And a public creation, but a public creation that's been limited. Um, but I think that in terms of reading MMT imperialism, I mean, there's things that frustrate me, right? Like I had mentioned before, there's the, you know, the MMT isn't helping uh, Doug Hanwood article and he cites he cites inflation under Allende, which to me is like kind of shocking as in, is the implication that uh, government spending under Allende is what created inflation as opposed to like economic blockade. And I think like the same people who would kind of read this as this like absolutist CIA plot, right? As opposed to um, the US power players in a coalition of right-wing Cold War movements in that time, right? Like you have 
Brazil military very involved in the Chilean coup, right? Like post uh, attempting to kill Schneider, right? In the 70s, mm -hmm. I don't know, but I'm going on a, a side point, but the point is like, that precisely the power read of scarcity, sometimes I feel like people assume that read is like preordained and by not understanding the way things worked in the first place, they're not understanding the way it works. So when someone like Doug Henwood is like, hey, look, like I'm super left wing. However, like Allende did create hyperinflation. I'm like, how am I supposed to interpret that? Like when first and foremost, you're like this, like, the CIA rotting George Bush's of like Episcopalians, like, or what led to desert storm in the nineties. And yet like you're saying that something to me that is like a right wing comment to say that like Allende created a flight inflation. Right. Well, it, it, it is interesting actually um, in regards to the inflation question, because the, the preconditions for inflation are, uh, just objectively complicated um and what i mean what yeah. i mean by that is like um government spending isn't the only thing to do it and embargo isn't the only thing you do it, it'll do it but both can lead to it um sure. since there's no place for the liquidity to go um and it can get bottled up um to to speak to that though a little bit um i hate when things get bottled up <laughs> sorry um <laughs> Uh, since, since you brought up Chile um, with, with Allende, um, you spend a lot of time, maybe most of your time in Chile. Um, and I have talked to you a little bit um, on Twitter um, about how uh, Chile is not – in the current, like, uh, pink tide that, you know, we see this it go, ever going in and out – um, Peru and Colombia are, are right now the focuses of a lot of attention. Peru for election reasons, Colombia for protest reasons. Um, but there's actually a lot going on in Chile. And the right-wing Chilean government seems to be somewhat in, in retreat. I mean, the, uh, the Christian Democrats are, are no longer dominant. Um, would you like to talk about what you see going on there and why is it important? Gosh, well, I think it's interesting because Chile was, I think, in 2019, obviously super in the news when you have the October 2019 protests sort of explode. Um, and then, you know, 2020, and, and that leads to like the decision that leads to a, a vote for a constitutional convention, right? And then it's funny, like when right before COVID was starting up in 2020, like March, 2020. So everything like started. Okay. So like Piñera, who's like going out right now, right? Piñera, Piñera's like second term, but like separate was he started in 2017, right? So you had had the two terms of Bachelet, who's like the center left. So she was like 20, 2006 to 2010. And then you had Piñera 2010 to 2013, 14. Bachelet again, and then like 2017, uh, you have Guillermo, who's sort of this candidate who the communists are, well, but I could get into the like left coalition things a lot, but there, there's a certain amount of like voter apathy post Bachelet, like the sense of the center left being corrupt, the sense of, um, yeah, that. And um, Pinera wins again in 2017, right? And then 2019, of course, you have famously the explosions in October where the student movement and avoiding the metro fairs like sort of leads to this huge crackdown and then protest movement, right? Which leads in later that year where you get uh, an agreement to vote, have a plebiscite for a new constitution, which like overwhelmingly won uh, last year, I think, was like 2020, uh, September, or something like that. And um, it was always like an interesting dichotomy in that this explosion, like October 2019, was weird in that you had like a very long uh, history of sort of like activation as well as like depoliticization. Because Bachelet, you know, Ashley is like a good center leftist, like did a lot of good solar panels, but also like early in her second term had 
big corruption scandals where it was interesting to me in 2017 when, you know, Gear was kind of a whatever uh, center left candidate, but it was interesting to me, the lack of interest in 2017 and that because Pineda was so hated because got to go back Chile, right? Because, you know, you have early 90s, democracy comes back in and Pineda is a senator for life, right? Mm -hmm. So there's always these like checks and balances. And then Pineda dies. I mean, sorry, not Pineda, um, Pinochet. Well, um, (laughs) Pinochet dies in like, I don't remember if he dies in 2005 or 2006. But sort of the initial wave of like young student protests is in 2006, the Pinguinos. They call them the penguins because they have like their school uniforms Mm -hmm. but um and then in 2011 and so i first lived here in 2010 and you have these different student you know you know you have the student movements you have the mapuche like indigenous movements you have uh people who are fighting against the privatized 80s like pension funds right the afp the jose pinera like what George Bush wanted to do to pensions in his, uh, the second George Bush in his most deranged neoliberal moments, right? This is what they did in the 80s when Jose Piñera, the brother of current second term president, Sebastian Piñera, who also like went to prison for a night in the 80s for like stealing a bank, but, um, <laughs> and is like the founder of the credit card industry in Chile, but um, Harvard Business School, you know? But um, I think, what happened in 2019 is that you sort of have this eruption that comes, you know, you'd had the year plus previous, you know, extended mobilization of different parts of the student movement, right? You have sort of the high school student movement because Pineda, honestly, it really surprised me that in 2017, like Gear was a very whatever center left candidate and he had beaten 22. Well, I could get into the whole communist with the center left versus Frente Amplio thing. That's a whole other thing. That Bea Sanchez had gotten 20% to, ha- to Guillermo's 22, but the, the, the participation was low in 2017. And that I, but I still was surprised like how easily Pineda won because I, I had been in the States for a couple of years, but like, you know, 2010 to 2013, like, yeah, Pineda was hated. Like, and, and you know, this is like, I'm talking like 2010, 2011 is when you have the student movement where people are for like a year occupying schools, just like, you know, you're going about your daily life and you end up like, oh, it's like a tear gas and oh, here's a protest. Oh, here, here's the thing about the dams and there's like some tanks going by, like, but also on the same note, like having these, you know, you're coming back in 2016 and you're having Bachelet with like an early corruption scandal in 2017, 2018 and you know, she's doing the center left, like solar thing. But at the same time, there's the sense of total depolitization from the neoliberal compromises, but also these like nascent long-term protest regimes, whether it's in the South with like the Mapuche, you know, under Bachelet and Pinera both where you have anti-terrorist laws that are used against like indigenous resistance where they're like fighting forestry companies right and burning Mm -hmm. trucks and then imprisoning people on hunger fasts shooting people on tractors right and so then i think what happens in 2019 is you have this you know you'd had a student student movement for that there were different things going on because you have the high school students like you know like the elite public schools like the national school they're like having almost Che Guevara year long right like confrontations with the police but also like you know at at big public universities uh you have women uh fighting uh sexual uh harassment sexual violence issues and then police like coming into bathrooms like in full riot gear and things like this and so I like women's bathrooms. And so I think what happens in 2019 is you have this sort of youth, predominantly female high school, college, like uh, fair evasion, right? And then that like quickly grows where suddenly you have like workers, just like normal lower middle class, like adults joining students and like evading fares going through stations. And then yeah, I mean, the whole thing happens where, right, the the right-wing government puts in a state of emergency and puts in a, a severe 
police sort of state of emergency. And then, you know, that's October, 2019. And then, you know, you have summer and gen you know, people die. You got that. And then huge protests, sort of almost like a plazas movement, right? Like the Middle East, when you have like, it ends up in like where everybody's always in Plaza Dignidad and you have like, you know, a million people there in the protests. But then COVID comes in, I guess, like March, April, 2020. And then I don't know, you have all these series of uh, kind of initially the constitutional vote was going to be in April for whether to approve or not like a constitutional convention. But that ended up happening in like October, September because of COVID. But I don't know, it's, it's just been sort of an interesting series of things because you had sort of the military crackdown late 2019 everybody took like a few months early 2020 summer and then COVID hit and then that austerity hit and then, but everybody knows that like the 2021 cycle is coming up. So, you know, late 2020, the uh, easily won the like approval for a new constitutional convention even, and then again, and like a month or two ago, one pretty convincingly different left factions, not all, especially like against the center left parties, but the constitutional convention, which has started and is going to be going the next like nine months, uh, has a pretty strong left representation, even especially outside the traditional parties. And, you know, it's interesting because this, this is a constitution that was written in the early 80s under Pinochet, right? Like mm -hmm. the, the Jaime Guzman, uh, I don't know if you guys know Jaime Guzman, but he was this like uh, right wing uh, law professor, basically, who's kind of like the mastermind of the Chilean neoliberal early 80s constitution. Uh, he was killed in the early 90s in the transition back to like democracy. But um yeah, it's a, it's, I mean, it's a huge, it's a huge moment in Chilean history in terms of like, okay, weird that like Pinera came back amidst like center left sort of apathy, but 2017, we have Pinera again, but then in 2019, like long term, all these different protest movements like coalesce in this anti state explosion, kind of whether it's teachers' protests or whether it's long term student movements or the indigenous or the dock workers or the, retirement fund protests, right? Like the AFP, which was like this privatized 80s Jose Pinera thing. And, and this sort of combination of depolitization with long-term nascent movements really exploded in part due to like state repression. You know, like it was new for me to like be on working from home and look at Twitter and it's just like tear gas in trains, you know, all that kind of stuff where you're like, all right, like they're not kidding. <laughs> but then I think, and I think that's the experience that most Chileans had, which was, was like, wow, we're like, this is late 2019 and we're under a state of emergency. Like there's like tanks, there's like people with guns in the street. Right. And then you, you have the summer chill for a second, then COVID comes. And then that austerity comes and then that massacre comes and that sort of sense of like, okay, the only way we can provide for anybody is to have these like percentage uh, withdrawals from their privatized uh, social security account. Uh, that's like the left populist point of view. And I don't know. I think people are still, I think 2021 it's like left has a certain hegemony as far as there's still like the crazy right wingers right like you have like levine who's gonna be like the you know he's just like a classic right wing crackpot pinochetista but i think this i mean it, there is a richness to having this left primary where you have holloway this like palestinian santiagino like recoleta mayor like you have boric who's like this like croatian like magallanes like south and these are like long-term players on the left and they're fighting about bullshit but and you, ha you have like mapuche linguist women like being president of the constitutional convention i mean it's a big it's a big time and so i think i think there's going to just be kind of a, a continuing 
movement of people figuring out what uh, Chile can look like. And I think that's beautiful. I don't know. Um, so there's a lot of history in that. Um, and do you think, well, okay, I actually, I should caveat that because I kind of know the answer. Um, I was about to say, do you think the complicatedness of Chilean recent politics and its historical politics, because basically people kind of were like, Pinochet, Allende, Pinochet, nothing. Like, <laughs> we don't talk about it. Um, and, uh, but, but I was wondering if that's partly why it's not being discussed in this current, like, uh, pink tide discussion. And yet we discussed off, uh, off air how crazy complicated Peruvian politics actually is. And it is being discussed kind of idiotically in my mind, um, by all sides, but it is at least being discussed. Whereas I feel like this, these, I mean, a constitutional convention in Chile is actually a really damn big deal and it's not coming up that much. Um, why do you think right. that is? Why do you think a lot of the uh, gringo left is just not even paying attention to it? I mean, I think I think there is an extent to which, like, when things are more uh, middle register, it's like it's more exciting when people are sending their lasers and yada yada, or when Venezuela is having a convention where they like kicked out half the people and it's super controversial. Whereas this doesn't have all that, right? Like, they're not trying to. They're not trying to like start an international shit storm. That's like, a, there's a certain genuineness that is complex that I think like wants to be repressed. That isn't as com that isn't as easy as just like, okay, here's tear gas. Here's a, here's a laser pointer. Right. And I think it's easy to just be like, okay, well, here's the eighties fucked up like Chilean constitution. And I think these subtleties of like, well, what is it? look like trying to move forward does, what does it look like if a protest movement gets some of what it what it wants these these are hard questions that i think sometimes people don't want to ask or deal with um which i understand it can be boring to think about like constitutions um <laughs> but i think that there's an extent to which there's a repression of long-term left, left center movements that people don't want to acknowledge where they want things to be black and white, where you have this like very clear left. Whereas I think since Pinochet in the early nineties, I think that sort of long-term center left concertacion like alignment always was both dealing in being way too neoliberal and also being uh, Camila Gomez, who you've had on a lot has talked about the way that like Peru and Chile also through the 70s, 80s into the 90s after like have a certain Yugoslavia and like reformist influence as far as like small worker collectives or small like, and which is what I'm trying to get at in terms of like watching all the debates, whether on the left or the right. Right now there's PMAs, like small business. Everything's like, do we subsidize them? Do we not? And even on the right, there's the science, there's like the right position of like super pro neoliberal uh, international companies, but also right wingers who are like, okay, well, like what's bad about the protests is that that's messing with small business profits and same with COVID, right? Like there's a reactionary reading of that. And I think, I think it's complicated now that like people are like in a nine month long process for a constitutional convention, which mind you, like That'll be this weekend, the, well, not for the center left, not for the Christian Democrats and socialists, provost and Norris, but like Holloway versus Boric, the left primary will be this weekend. And like, you know, Holloway, the communist candidate is more like, all right, let small business fail with some subsidies. Boric is more like in this Amarillo, like, yes, we need to say subsidies, but also like, what are we at? The point is that like it's in a different moment where it's like in this moment of like all right like what's it's not in the peak of like when pre-covid you had months and months of sustained full not not full riot but you know a certain amount of like 
a lot of normal people are like just spending their free time to go out and throw rocks at tanks. And that, <laughs> and you know, that's just like, and, and not as in like, that's someone who's in a party or who's an anarchist just as in like, those are those four to five months where that's like, what's going on. And so then like you have COVID come in where that all changes in a way, but is also related to the imposition of this new reality where you can't leave your house if you aren't prepared with an excuse post like 10 PM. Right. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't, I don't know, but I think, and so I think there's a pretty strong vaccinization drive vaccination, Jesus mm -hmm. uh, drive in Chile. And so I think, has that drive avoided the scandals that have plagued both the Peruvian and the Brazilian drive? Like that there's all, there's been all these backdoor corruptions and weird deals and some, um, okay. There's, but not as bad um, as yeah. Some, but yeah. Okay. They were like pretty early on it. Like there's some, we're still like Levine, the right candidate is like, um, he's the, been the mayor of Las Condes, like a pretty upper middle class, a mm -hmm. suburb of Santiago for a while. And there was some like shit about like, if there's a third vaccine and Clinica Las Condes and if they're hoarding it or not and all this stuff. But I do think like the, the Pineda right wing government was like pretty in early on on like negotiations with uh, different companies and especially also like different Chinese companies, like for whatever mm. series of reasons, like the negotiations for Chile, like they compared to others in the region got in on vaccine stuff early on. Um, but there's also still, that's yeah. another controversy with Halloway. Halloway and his like mayoralty and in, in Recoleta, like approved early on, uh, some COVID drug that ended up not working out. And so there's like this debate, like, oh, like was this using Recoleta scientist versus like the better Santiago, um, Scientists, because also like part of getting the vaccine and was that like different clinics in Santiago already had like sort of research relationships with some Chinese developers. Okay, um, so you get it. Yeah. So 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 <laughs> so yes, there is some developmental worries, but nowhere near as like massive um, as what we're hearing coming out of Brazil or even or even uh, Peru. Also, um, Chile's COVID response was not ideal, but it doesn't seem to have been as bad as a lot of the other areas in the region. Um, is, is that an accurate assessment or, or not? I mean, I think yes and no. Like, I mean, it's still, it, it's, it's, yeah, it's a yes and no that they did have like more vaccine early on. They did like put in pretty strong protocols, but still... I think that's why I mentioned like 2019 because it kind of felt like you had like early 2020 where you went to summer and then March came and you went back and suddenly it was like the same protocols as during the 2019 like uprisings. But I think that there was an extent to which they did handle it well early on, but also that like the ways the scarcity of the public health system and the not having enough government support as far as subsidies and forcing people back into work and the economy that I, I do think there was like a pretty strong um, uh, hit as far as people getting sick, people getting, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, like a lot of, I mean, I don't, I don't know how exactly to compare it to whether it be Peru or Argentina, you know, there's been interesting there's been interesting phases and there's been things in Chile that went better than other places, but also things that like over time kind of very much got away from them and that are um yeah, I mean it's not great. I mean like forty thousand people have died in Chile. This is like a country of like max twenty million and you know, people talk about I mean, like during the dictatorship of Pinochet, people talk about like three thousand people dying. And so I mean these are still like big scales that things are yeah, occurring on. Huge numbers. I mean I to be fair, everywhere's had kind of, of course mind boggling huge numbers. But yeah. Um yeah. it does seem like if I'm doing just spitballing math in my head, it, it's that's pretty serious, but it's not Peru. Um, yeah. Um, so I guess the last question, um, you spent, 
Have you spent time in any other uh, South or Central American countries? Um, a little, uh, but not much. I've, you know, like I've spent a little time in Lima or Buenos Aires, but that's it. Like I haven't okay. been to like Brazil or Mexico. Like I, I'm just like I'm very much like of a Santiago Conosur like point of view. Yeah. So it, it's like me in Mexico, and like I can speak extemporaneously about Mexico for hours and hours and hours. Um, you asked me about even Guatemala and I'm like, I can tell you about five things, but um, so I, it's similar. However, I, I do want to ask you um, this, you know, other than pink wave fetishism, which is, which we, we get all the time. Sure. I find that the American left and Americans in general, despite the fact that, there is a, dis- a diaspora of people who make up more of a, you know, more in raw numbers in the United States and than like any singular country in Latin America. Um, don't know that much about what is going on in Latin America. And, and I, it was occurring to me as you were describing the complicatedness of the situation, one difference between Chile and even Colombia and definitely then say, Peru or Mexico right now um, is there is no singular, frankly, Bonapartist figure for anyone to attach a narrative to. Um, you don't have a Castillo. You don't have an AMLO. You don't. I mean, Holloway to an extent, but but it's Holloway is not the clear winner yet, right? Like yeah, right, yeah, yeah. So I, I do think he'll win this weekend, but right, but he still doesn't necessarily, yeah. Because in the November, you still have the centrist candidates and Lavigne on the right, yeah. I, well, I think part of the, the thing about Castillo is, like, Castillo breaks the American political mind. Like, oh, it, nothing, like, not, not give Right, like, it's just, like, what do you mean? <laughs> Marxist-Leninist party, but he rebelled against the Marxist-Leninist. He came out of what seemingly was a right-wing vigilante group, but as a left-wing thinker, but he's against abortion, even against the wishes of his party. But he's reaching out to the more normal cosmopolitan left to form a coalition. But then he's like also reaching out to the pro market people, even though he said he was going to nationalize. Like, like, and I'll be honest, it breaks my mind trying to like map it. And I mean, it doesn't. I mean, yeah. I mean, I mean, to me, to me, I guess suppose like part of what the superstructure and neoclassical Marxism critique does illuminate is like, I do think there is a connection between this sort of like, I'm not, I'm not pro abortion. And also I'm a leftist who uh, is in line with the world bank line on the central bank. <laughs> like to me, there is a convergence right. there, which I uh, don't think is, is nothing. Some kind of figure eight horseshoe theory or something. Um, um, you know, you know, we, we we can invoke Lacan as we will. <laughs> <laughs> I'm um, uh, yeah, I think you did that just to get on my nerves. Because um, I know you've listened I, I, to I, enough I, I of would, my podcast to know I my opinions never, about Lacan. <laughs> no, I would never. I would never do a thing like that. Um, <laughs> so, um, that sort of. I guess um, my my question is um, <laughs> I'm going to ask this in an inflammatory way uh, and then you can kind of discern what I mean by it. Um, should the DSA send a, um, co- mm-hmm. a, a, a Kickstarter funded congregation of gringos to Chile to monitor the Constitutional Convention? <laughs> Oh my god. It's just like a social nightmare already. <laughs> I mean, look, like I understand the impulse of like DSA like caring about international places and wanting to be in the sort of America's solidarity space. Like I honor that impulse, but yeah, like as somebody who's you know, I'm I feel like I'm sort of in this middle space where I'm like happen to be a gringa from abroad. Like I know you started that way too, like in Asia, like this gringa abroad, like podcasting, but I also I don't know, I'm not like a lifetime organize I don't know, I don't come from this lifetime organizer point of view. And I, I do think like the people I tend to know and just like 
the paths of life are going to be cynical to people being like, I am the, the communist party slash DSA coalition. I don't know. It's just like, even the people who are of those milieus for decades and decades, it's just, there's something like a little bit like pretentious or try too hard. It's like DSA wanting to be, I think, I think it's great that DSA is like, making a space for activists in different cities and that sort of these left tending U S candidates sort of have a, uh, activist base that's supporting them. But I think sometimes there's a desire to shore up a sense of anxiety about like what your place in the world is. And it's like, it's okay. Like you don't, these things are really complicated in all these countries too. Like DSA doesn't have to like intervene to make sure that. Well, I mean, Lee, what could it even do? Days. Well, I mean, like seriously, well. like what could it even do? I mean, like, yeah. Um, but, but I guess, you know, my, my, my point on that is, is like if the DSA had a very formalized structure, some kind of international or even just a, like a group inviting it, um, that's a, t to me, a fundamentally different deal. Um, and, um, I, I do think that, you know, that we haven't seen a plethora of Jacobin articles on this in the same way. <laughs> and th th there, there is a sense in which, unfortunately, <laughs> uh, I think and, and you may, may or may not disagree with me. Um, a lot of the, what we're really seeing with, with, with the uh, left analysis, of a lot of these Latin American uh, executive figures is a very simple, um, narrative politics around individuals that often people just don't have the context to fully contextualize what's going on in these countries. And they're not working with people on the ground to give them that context when they go into it. They may have in Peru. I'm sure there is someone who is hosting, you know, hosting them. But that's uh, the thing. But, yeah. But that's what pisses me off too, is it's like, yeah, like in all of these countries, there's somebody in that same camp, right? Like, mm -hmm. which is this like DSA organizational discipline, like left, left, left center disciplinary mm -hmm. camp. And like, I'm sympathetic to that, but that, yeah, I mean, I, I do think there can be at times like a fantasy of like the originary class perspective. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you know, for example, I understand that in Peru, they've had a very different left movement as far as like, Oh, like there's this peasantry, like rural left point of view that is more socially conservative, which like, yeah, like, look, I've lived like eight, nine, almost 10 years in Chile. And I'm like a fucking like super queer gringa. And yeah, like that's shocking to me. Like the idea that like a left candidate in Chile would be like, I'm not, I'm not sure about abortion or the gays. No, that's not going to fly. Right. And, and, but then like, there's these Peruvian Chilean intentions. So I'm like, and especially as a green guy, I'm alert to that. Right. But I think there's a sense of like, I don't know. I completely, this is, I was, right. uh, yeah. <laughs> well, it's, I mean, it's I, just, I, it's, it's complicated. And, mm -hmm. and, it, and, and I think, and and I think I'm I'm sympathetic to this like counter read, which is like these preppy, like morally superior gringos who don't know shit are like gonna judge people, yada yada. But I'm also like sympathetic to the other side, which is like who is like the queer 20, 19 year old in rural Peru who's like, yeah. I want education. I want like a laugh spending program, but like, I'm scared of like a, this neoliberal piece of shit. Mm -hmm. Fukimori down the road, as well as like this homophobic, like leftist bitch. Like, you know what I mean? And like, I would like to meet somebody to date and move to Lima. Like, I don't know. I just feel like it's unfortunate to think that after some of the beautiful movements of well, 70s, 80s, 90s, that that would be a thing that, yeah, I, I totally understand that that's not always like fully formed or like dominating the entire uh, discourse of whoever is like barely in power. But I also don't want to like 
dismiss those impulses. I mean, like in Chile, you know, I was there in like 2018 when you have like the biggest protest post uh, Pinochet where you have like nearly a million people for the Ocheme for the, like the women's international day, or, like just like full intense riot protest vibe. And like, I don't want, I don't want to repress those influences. I want to like, and, and that happens throughout the region, right? Like whether it be like Mexico, Peru, like, these places where you have these like proto conservative leftist figures, but also these really strong feminist movements, whether it be like anti feminist side. I mean, it's complicated, right? Like this happens within gay communities as well. Like, I don't know, I'm, I'm on another thing, but like the point is that I want, I want to lean into the complexity of these different regions and the complexity of their, histories and communities and their liberation projects, which are like super both heterogeneous and overlapping. Yeah. I, I guess my, my note, um, and maybe this is be one to wrap this up on is, is similar that the, in some ways, yes, rural Latin America is just as or even more conservative than, than the rural United States. However, um, this idea that you're that like by going to, to to Latin America, going to a parochial like early 20th century, 19th century Catholic borderline theocracy that a lot of people seem to think, you know, they 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 they, they would they don't say it that way, but when when they talk about their stereotypes of the way like these governments work and what their laws are, um. They they seem to think that like the rural urban divide that's everywhere on Earth is not in Latin America that um, that also that uh, that queerness equates to to wit to richness because of the media portrayal of of queerness frankly and and they're basically essentializing stereotypes that really flatten out a region that, I mean, particularly when we talk about the Southern cone, isn't even that underdeveloped. Like it's, it's, uh, I mean, yeah. right. Well, that's so, what, that, that's, I, I think that's like shit like that is like what annoys me so much about like, I totally understand the left populist impulse behind like Pope Francis, but it's like, the feminist movement in Argentina is like a like power as fuck and like be like super radical and they're not like oh Pope Francis like do you think it's okay if I marry a woman do you think it's okay if I have an abortion like no they know he's not into either of those things and like while I think it's great that you have like I guess an Argentine Pope who wants like international universal health care I think to be honest it's like rude to act like the history of the left in Argentina is like a Pope Francis B Mara Luna. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, when there's like a lot of other shit going on. Yeah, and I get it because like I get that it's like a big world. Like, what the fuck do I know about what's going on in like so many fucking places? Obviously, so much, and so I'm I'm sympathetic in that way. But I guess I'm not sympathetic to this sort of knee jerk impulse to dismiss when I assume that most places it's much more complicated than I know. And I understand this impulse to be like, all right, well, like I'm counterfactual to this Bidenist, like liberal point of view, but it's like, is it really still like 1976 and we like all like, I don't know, like Bedia Stalinist. I don't know. I don't know. I, I would say, uh, <laughs> I would say to to a lot of that, um, I mean, one, just to speak on Pope Francis for a second, I find it interesting how we wouldn't, we don't tell like indigenous people in Canada rightly to shut up about their complaints about the Catholic Church and how Pope Francis is standing in the way of any kind of reconciliation there. And yes, the Pope is. Um, but to... Um, uh, Pope Francis's history in Argentina is actually super fucking complicated and not as clean or as nearly as leftist as people thought. To be fair, that's kind of how he survived. But but it's of course. I remember I remember people in the know in Latin America when when he became pope saying like 
he might be progressive, he might not be, but you can't actually assume it from his bishoprics in Argentina. Um, and and honestly, I'm also I've also point out to people. Uh, um, now I'm not Catholic, but I do have a lot of Catholic family, and I, I know my. Catholic I love family. I love the church. <laughs> uh, um, I do have a lot of Catholic family. Dasha, Dasha just just Dasha just appears. Oh, okay, you, you went full yeah. Dasha on me. Um, um, <laughs> but the this entire like uh, I've tried to point out the people that like um, Pope Boniface uh, or Cardinal Ratzinger um, actually has on many things where they think that the popes are different. They have identical positions or just their, their emphasis and speaking about them are slightly different. And I, that's, that's very frustrating to me when people try to cynically, I, I actually think a lot of the left is secular and they're trying to cynically use religion anyway, but um, it's, it's it's kind of a very frustrating thing when they're also silencing. I do think kind of silencing other things going on in Latin America and washing it out. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, even in the case of Peru, Lima is a is you know a, a large urban area that I think if you were from a Spanish speaking part of the United States, uh, you would not find totally unfamiliar. Um, I, I know that like Medellin, um, where I have been. Um, and some other places in Colombia are definitely that way. So it's, right. it's, uh, I, it's very frustrating to, to, to see this all get washed out in a lot of the narrative um, uh, about this. Um, so uh, we've talked about a lot. Um, I want to thank you for coming on and uh uh, we will probably have Will, the final of the superstructure people that for me to talk to, uh, I think either the end of this month, or beginning of next month. Um, and, uh, we, uh, we'll probably have, um, another, I'm trying to get someone else from Chile to come on. Cause I'm also, I'm really sort of. I am a little frustrated about how undercovered it is right now, since there's a like a constitutional convention and a major governmental change in a in a South America country of significant and not economic import is not a it's small a big deal. Time. Right? No, it's a big, I mean, it's a big time. I mean, I think I think the entire Chilean left is like super engaged and it's yeah, a big. It, it's a long. It's you know, this is like decade plus in the making decades. And I think that all different factions are very engaged. And yeah. I mean, yeah. I think there's less of the perhaps glamor of 2019, but I, I mean, I think the Chilean left is in probably like the most a important B powerful time. Like since I've lived in Chile, I first lived here 2010. I've been here like eight, nine, 10 years. And yeah, I mean, I think it's a really interesting time uh, for seeing kind of where things go. All right. Well, on that note, I uh, thank you for coming on and have a great rest of your day. Thank you.